Here are a few responses to the mailroom last week. Uh, what tripe, said Lotak on Twitter. How about redoing the programme with more representative men, emailed Ralph. Even worse than I was expecting, wrote Mike Buchanan on his blog. A mangina presenter, two mangina studio guests and a feminist comedian. BBC ideological balance at its finest. Can I read out a positive one? <laughs> right. Okay, well, if you thought we were a bit wishy-washy liberal last week, then this episode might be the one for you. It is the angry edition. So, joining me in the studio in our ongoing quest to define modern man, I have um, a series of sparkling guests. But first, I want to talk to Martin Daubney, former editor of Loaded, turned writer for The Telegraph, and much else besides. Uh, Martin, what makes you angry? What makes me angry, actually, is the, the continuing sort of belittling of men's issues, actually. Today, there was a report out by the Sutton Trust showing that white working class boys are the bottom of education's class. Uh, they've been behind every year for 27 years. Nothing's been done about this. And, you know, if you, if you bring up the notion that, that men or boys are somehow behind, then you are kind of ridiculed as a, as a man baby or you know, this ludicrous kind of lexicon. And I think... But who, know, who belittles you? OK, if we start from the Houses of Parliament, you know, if we start from International Men's Day last year, you know, Jess Phillips famously sort of you know, said, every, every day's International Men's Day, you know, that, that, that really, you know, erudite kind of comical observation. And, and basically the debate was stifled, although it did go ahead. Actually, her, her resistance turned to be the best PR for the day. I'm an ambassador for International Men's Day. That happened. And would it be fair to say, I mean, I, I read you on, on Twitter and on social media, would it be fair to say you harness other men's anger. There's a lot of anger out there, and I think men have, have good reason to, to be angry in, in lots of areas. You know, if one of the things I hear all the time is, you know, for example, you know, spending time with fathers who, who aren't allowed access to their, to their children because they've been kind of, in their terms, they've been shafted in divorce and family courts, and they feel, you know, they've gone from being kind of, you know, solid family men with a purpose to suddenly being kind of living in a bed sit on their own. And this is what's driving the male suicide epidemic. And there is anger there. And we need to channel that anger in a, in a constructive way. But at the moment, there's no conduit. There's nowhere for them to go. So they do gravitate towards... You know, Isn't that the internet? Isn't that exactly where people go? Yeah, Isn't well, the internet just flooded with angry men? It's flow with angry people. You know, we need to, I think we need to take this conversation away from the fact that men have sole custody of anger. OK, let's try not to make this men versus women, because I think that sure. is a fair point. We are talking about male anger, though. Let's meet another couple of our guests. Uh, David Baker from the School of Life. Darren, I'll explain your story in just a second. David, are you an angry person? You know, I think I've, I've been angry for most of my life, kind of internally. I was kind of bullied quite a lot by a couple of teachers at my school. It felt really out of order, really unreasonable. But if you're a child and adults in responsible places are bullying you, there's nothing you can do. That rage just sort of builds up inside you. Wait, is rage and anger the same thing? I think it's not. I think rage is actually the impotent anger. That's the fuel of anger, if you like. Now, we either turn that anger towards someone else we kick the cat, we go and have a row with our partner rather than the person who's, who's done the, you know, a grievance to us. Or, sadly, we turn it in on ourselves. And I think I spent a lot of my life turning it in on myself because I was a polite middle-class man who was brought up not to resort to violence. I still now would be terrible in a fight. I know I would lose an actual physical fight, so but I will do everything I can. isn't a good thing, is it? It doesn't matter what class you're No, but sometimes up. you want to. I mean, you know, that's the feeling of anger. I think anger is a justifiable and useful first stage emotion, but it's what you do with that that counts. OK, Darren, let's meet you, because you're a policeman and a barber, which is an unusual combination in the first place. It certainly is. I'll ask about the barbering in a minute, because it is an important part of your tale, but, but first of all... I mean, as a police officer, I imagine you've had a lot of anger directed at you. You could say that, yeah. What kind of thing? Uh, Low-level anger, passive anger, the aggressive anger, shouting, rage. You can see that sort of rage. And you're kind of trained as a police officer to, to look at body language and read body language and get cues from people. Clench your jaw, don't you? So you could be talking, yawn a lot as well when you get angry. Yawn? Yeah, I tend to yawn when I'm getting that sort of feeling in the pit of my stomach that's starting to, to burn. It almost tires me out. Equally, when someone spits in your face, it's very clear what uh, they think. Yeah. What does that do to you as a police officer who's trying to keep the peace and trying to stop them from breaking the law? If somebody spits at me. Yeah, or, you know, threatens to hit you or whatever it is. 
it infuriates me that they think that they have a sort of a, a right to be able to do that, to push me out of the way. Please don't do that. Push me again. Please don't do that. Push me again. Uh, like, I'm not being funny, but you're a big lad. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see him at home, but you're built like a brick outhouse, mm. and you still get that. Yeah. I've also heard from other police officers that sometimes if you're under physical threat, and this isn't in any of the training manuals, it's not what you're supposed to say, but sometimes the easiest way to resolve a situation is to match it with an implied physical threat or actual force. I have a taser, so... Uh, <laughs> kind of big yellow banana sat on your stab vest in front of people. It's not just breaking up fights that you've done, is it? You've done all kinds of policing. Yeah, so 12-year um, career, uh, spanning sort of four or five different roles, dealing with day-in, day-out domestics, dealing with curb crawlers, dealing with soliciting. I've been to many a death which is my pet hate, uh, pretty harrowing, pretty horrendous. Um, I've been in the river pulling bodies out that have been in there for six six weeks, body recovery, road traffic collisions. So we make sure every part is, is picked up, and that could be sort of five P size. What's the effect of that on you? I'm sort of struggling with being able not being able to control my anger. So... That's what makes me angry as a person. Um, but going back to that stature sort of thing, you know, I was, I was nearly 18 stone when I was uh, back in the day. I've lost a considerable amount of weight. But an 18 stone bloke basically turning around to, to the sergeant and saying, Sergeant, I'm struggling with that. That's it. F- for me, that was that was a big thing. And, and something I wasn't actually a- readily able to do. I think that's... First of all, it's amazing to have you here at the table saying what you've done. You. you know, it's it's really tough for us men to say, I'm struggling, like you said. You know, whether you're an 18-stone bloke or a, 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 a six-stone bloke or whatever it might be. We're kind of brought up, aren't we, as men, not to be able to say, I, can't, I don't quite get this. I'm not quite sure what to do. We're meant to somehow in the culture say, OK, let's do this. Let's try that. Even if it's the wrong idea, let's just have an idea and do something about it. I work a lot pe- with, with businessmen, with managers, for example. You know, senior managers can't say, I actually haven't a clue how this project's going. And so they just crash the project rather than admit mm-hmm. mistakes. And maybe anger, for me, anger is kind of, certainly in my life, is kind of defence against that feeling of feeling insecure or not really knowing what to do or feeling vulnerable and feeling impotent. And actually, that's the one thing we don't want to feel as yeah, well, guys, this, because we're not really it. meant to be men. We're not real men if we, we're feeling insecure exactly. or but, unable to do something. Yeah, but, you know? but isn't that it? You're saying we're sort of trained or we're brought up to feel we can't talk about it. Isn't it deeper than that? We almost feel in ourselves like we can't feel it. So therefore, it becomes anger and it becomes other things. Yeah, because I think it makes us feel ashamed. I think shame is this huge emotion that men can't fess up oh, to feeling. You're nodding, Darren. I absolutely agree with that. I, I I felt shame going going and getting some help as to how I was feeling. What are people going to think of me? How are my colleagues going to react? How's my boss going to react? How's my boss's boss going to react? Martin, I think you know what I, I'm really heartened and sort of you know amazed about your story is that we we hear all this this stuff, don't we, about male privilege and how men commit all the crime and men are the problem. Men aren't allowed to have problems. Now here's a guy so, literally clearing clearing up the mess you know, of the most violent men. And so what I think is about fostering an environment where we are allowed to be vulnerable. And there is still a feeling that it's easier to get angry because it's what men know. Like we, we, uh, and it comes out as anger. But it's much, much harder, you know, for men to say, yeah, I'm suffering here. But it takes people like you for the rest of us to have the permission. On last week's show... I heard that amazing anecdote of, of Joe Strummer from The Clash, you know, my all-time favourite band, saying how his brother committed suicide and he opened up. I wish I'd have heard that story while Joe was alive. Mm. Other men leading the way. So, Darren, one of the things you're doing now is exactly that. You are encouraging other men to talk about uh, their own problems and their own anger yeah. through the barbary. Yeah, definitely. Tell us about that. So, one of my roles within the police was uh, mental health triage. So, I kind of, with the barber shop wanted to put out a little bit of my experience. Um, oh, explain how that works. So you and your wife now run a barbershop. Yeah, yeah, so we run what, a barbershop. How is that, got to, how is that directly linked <laughs> to mental health? I found sort of working in, in a barbershop, making people feel better, actually made me feel better. And, and stats suggest 
that as barbers, as Martin said earlier to me outside, publicans, we're the sorts of first line for people that are going to sit in a chair and say, do you know what, Darren? I'm struggling with this. I'm not talking about me being able to perform miracles in the shop. It's just about being able to offer Samaritan's telephone number, offer the panic attack. There's a panic attack phone line that you can ring and speak to uh, or listen to a message that gives you breathing techniques. And But do these people present as angry? Because, you know, you were saying that you're having a different conversation to when you were a policeman. I wonder if they're the same people. That's a good question. Um, I see a different demeanour to what I did uh, when I was sort of when I'm out and about policing. Um, you can sense it in the eyes and the, and the facial expression still that, you know, the clenched jaw, you know, they're talking about this. They're talking about the girlfriend that they've just had an argument with before they left or your girlfriend wants them to have some sort of haircut and they want something completely different so they've had a complete clash and a barney. You can sense when somebody's at angry but i'd see a, a lot less anger than when i was out on the streets so martin is talking about the anger better than venting the anger of course it is you know it's always the, the lions barbers collective when that first came out I, I interviewed the owner straight away for the telegraph i did the first story on that i think it's an amazing utilization of a male only space you know these 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 spaces are demonized men only and they must be plotting the the downfall of feminism no 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 we, we want to have a beer and a cigar yeah. and feel safe amongst our kind of brothers yeah we don't need to sit around kind of having tantric massages and, and, and being like Sting. But at the same time, you know, if we feel that we have got a problem, you know, later on, I, I trust this bloke. It's not about feminising men. Okay. It's not about making men talk like women. It's, it's allowing mm. that to happen if it's, if, if it's going to be a natural thing. I think barber shops are an incredibly important you know, area for that. And, and anger can, can calm down. And, and when you go through the anger phase, the next phase is, is the sweet spot, I think. But, well, you use yep. the word safe. That's very interesting mm. to me. What are you safe from that a woman's presence would be problematic for? You're Probably safe from... Political correctness as well, I would yeah, say. You're safe from being judged. Yeah. You're safe from being judged as not a man. This thing we don't really understand. It's like, it's not deemed as societally manly to be vulnerable. Well, this is a conversation, obviously, that is going on beyond this studio. So I'm going to read out a couple of other comments that you lot are making out there. Uh, Build and Destroy, that's his name on Twitter, uh, says, Not having the power to change anything makes me angry, especially at work. Uh, someone who calls themselves Hequel uh, says paternity fraud, contact denial, parental alienation, the gender justice gap, sexist education and MGM makes me angry. Now, he doesn't mean the, the movie studio there. That's a reference, isn't it, Martin, to, to circumcision. It's become it is, yeah. a term now mm. to talk about male mm. genital mutilation. That's right. I, I mean, that's a small example. I don't have a long discussion about circumcision, but the attempt, the attempt is to say there's an equivalence. You know, if, if you're an anti-circumcision lobbyist, the, the attempt is to say there's an equivalence between circumcision for ritual or medical reasons, yeah. you know, compared mm. to female genital mutilation. And objectively, there, there isn't, is there? So no. why is that happening? It sometimes feels like men are professionally getting angry about things and suggesting that things are worse than they actually are. Well, I, I, I do work with, with the guys who campaign against male genital mutilation and they, they absolutely do take it as seriously as FGM. But it out. isn't as serious. Is but it? but, but, but it's, it, it is illegal in the UK, but it's in the face of staunch... You know, yeah, but what's illegal? Taking a 13-year-old boy and circumcising against his will? Circumcising yes. a child... Yes. Yeah, but is, circumcising is, a baby is illegal. isn't illegal, but they use the phrase to suggest all circumcision is just as bad. Yeah, and and they believe it is. Yeah, uh, fine, but but why use the why use the phrases of feminism? Why use the phrases that are there to protect women? Why say there's an equivalence between men and women? We're against each other. That's, that's the I'm bit that. They, they, to, yeah. I think they 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 believe that there is, and I think this is part of the underlying issue that there is a feeling amongst amongst these people that men's issues aren't taken as seriously as women's issues, and it makes them angry. Clearly, there's a lot of anger out there. I think there's a wider problem. I don't think it's to do with feminism or to do with David Baker from the School of Life. The using the words of feminism to talk about male rights or whatever, I think actually the world has become a really scary and confusing place. And all of us are feeling like the world is falling apart underneath our feet. You know, there's Syria, there's the rise of Putin, there's what's happening in America, there's the global financial crisis, there's climate change. All this sort of thing seems to be kind of out of our grip and out of our reach. And the response to that kind of fragmentation is anger. OK, I'm going to play a tape here and then bring in another guest. 
Yes, the tape comes from last Saturday evening uh, when the American Joe Queenan presented his brief history of anger here on Radio 4. Uh, the uh, channel have asked if we could make a virtue of this by ringing him up for some more. Uh, so first, you'll hear a clip from the programme followed by Joe Queenan talking to us on the phone about anger. So now I'm going to do something really stupid. I'm standing outside a crowded tube station at rush hour and I'm going to ask people what makes them really angry. Excuse me, can I ask you what makes you angry? No, some passive aggression here. Excuse me, no, no answer. Can I ask you what makes you angry? People blocking the top of stairs. Good one. Um, I was with my son on Mother's Day, and two guys were sitting at a nearby table. Then the one guy said something that was really offensive. So my son went over and reamed the guy out, and I threw ice on him. That was exhilarating. Like, that, that, that expression of anger carried me through for, like, the next year. I didn't have to get angry at anybody because I'd, I'd embarrassed this guy. And my wife officially sort of said, oh, you guys, how can you behave like that? But I think she really liked it. But you do get angry. I'm a satirist, and that's what you do. You're angry about everything. You're constantly, constantly finding things to be angry about, but it's the level of anger. You know, as A.J.P. Taylor once said, I am a man of strong opinions, lightly held. My kids make me angry. My job makes me angry. The producer makes me angry. This street makes me angry. Then there's my wife, other people's wives, other drivers, airports, and worst of all, my football team, which has kept me in a permanent state of apoplexy since 1960, when I was just 10 years old. I mean, this is one of the things during the election was that people felt that Donald Trump was sort of hovering over Hillary Clinton and that he was using anger against her all the time and to a lot of people it was disgraceful. He won the election though so obviously most men in this country were fine with it. Joe Queen in there talking to our producer. I quite like that excuse by the way next time I pour a glass of anything over someone just to say uh, I'm not angry I'm a satirist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but you made an interesting point there about his wife quite liking him getting angry that's something we don't often talk about that women actually quite like to see men getting angry. Martin do you have a view on that? Well I do think we live in a world where everything's becoming kind of homogenised and muted and we're all encouraged you know, men are encouraged to be more feminised, women have been encouraged to be more masculine so I guess, you know, are we still drawn towards, you know, more extremes in certain ways? You know, we certainly see, you know, we're told that we should all be wearing pinafores and being kind of beta males and you know, sort of wearing papooses. And then, and then the wife runs off with an alpha male from work. So who knows? Well, we're joined by a real live woman now. So let's, you, you're here to represent all women. Hey, Abby I am, I'm speaking on behalf of all women. <laughs> I've got a lot of opinions on that. Um, well, Abby is here. She uh, recently wrote an article. Well, let me just read the opening couple of lines. Okay. Uh, here goes. For several years now I've had a dark and fairly unusual <laughs> hobby. Uh, when I'm alone and bored and the mood strikes me, I'll open up my laptop and head for a particularly unsavoury corner of the internet. Uh, Abby Wilkinson, tell us more about that. Um, yeah, the manosphere is what they call it. It's um, a sort of loose collection of websites where some of the angriest men I've ever encountered kind of hang out. It includes kind of pickup artists, um, traditional marriage advocates, like you need to try and find a young woman because they're easier to control, that's the thing. Um, people who are very angry at the pickup artist movement because they've tried all the tricks and they still can't get laid as much as they would <laughs> like because that's, you know, that's how the world works, right? Um, but they, because they failed. Yeah, they, they, were prom <laughs> they were promised that this would be the trick to... But, I mean, Martin referred earlier to male suicide rates and so on. Do you, do you detect that some of that, and we're sort of laughing at the sort of sexual inadequacy, do you, do you detect that some of that anger then boils over into such self-loathing that it's that kind of dangerous? I, I think these people are sad. Like, some of them are very sad. And um, it's a funny thing. Like, I get, they email me a lot, um, and then they, or they tweet at me sometimes, and they'll, be, they'll say horrible things, and it'll just be like, but... For, for you to get to the point where you were saying this to me, a stranger, like, what has, like, bubble, what has actually got you to the point where, like, I am a target for this kind of well of emotion? So uh, we just went looking through some of your writing, which yeah. has had some pretty hostile responses from, you're probably right, they probably are young men. 
Uh, F you slut skank. Submit that pussy bitch. You know what? The first time I ever got stuff like that, it upsets me, and now I'm just very, very desensitised to it. Um, but I think that's me being in a position of not caring, because I remember when it did did very, very much upset me to the point that I couldn't really concentrate on anything else or get on with my life. But that's made me, it's made me really angry that you are sensors, desensitised to it. That's yeah. disgusting stuff. Yeah. How sad we're living in a world that it's happened so much to you that now you're well, desensitised. I want to talk about age. We're, we're assuming they're young. Sometimes they have pictures and photos and they're, they're quite old. But, okay, um, well, this is it. Like, so, uh, in a way, does anger sneak up on you as a man the older you get? You know, actually, is it about loss of sexual potency? Maybe it's about your children either not seeing your children or actually your children not liking you anymore. And, and you know, you yourselves, have you felt yourself get angrier as you get older I, I, um, let's, let's start with you Darren no I, I would say actually as a young man mm. I was full of testosterone you know I think the older you get the stereotype is grumpier you get yeah but you know by the time you're in your 50s aren't you more likely to be dripping in the kind of seething resentment that we know well, I mean I feel I am in my 50s I'm 52 and uh, I think looking the up. opposite thank you I'm coming to your barbershop <laughs> um, I think it's the opposite I think actually it's something we can do something about actually we can manage how we relate to anger as we grow older as we grow up what we probably get used to is the fact the world will keep on irritating us. You know, bad news, whatever it might be, bad personal relations that make us angry, that make us irritated what by about the world. Your, but we can, you know, for me, I want to make sure that I get as angry as little as possible about things I can't do anything about. That just seems a total waste of time that and energy. That the angriest for you. Well, <laughs> as, as Darren just said, David, you're looking very good. This isn't personal to you. But people lose their looks as they get older. People start balding. People start putting on weight. For me, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a gay guy and I, I, I like certain se sexy men do look good. But I like vulnerable men who can talk about their vulnerabilities are totally sexy. Martin, what do you think? I think it's an irrefutable truth to say that, you know, the older you are, you know, the more likely you are to have suffered a bad life experience. Losing your job, being made redundant, being thrown on the scrap heap, that kind of feeling is more likely to affect you as you're older. Part of the thing about male anger is that a lot of men don't think anybody gives a shit. They just don't think. It's like, well, I'm a bloke. Well, you've lost your job. Well, tough. Suck it up. That's It'll life. One, yeah. You know, and, and so, so having somewhere to go to, to, to vent the anger, which then becomes something more productive, like your barbers, I think is, is amazing. I wish more people would open up to me. OK, so can we all agree? I mean, last week's episode was called inadequacy. This week's episode is called anger. Can we all agree they're linked things? That anger comes from inadequacy. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, and I think we need to... The barbershop is great, but I also think we need to place sometimes actually to physically have an outlet for our anger. I think something's happened in our world that our physicality of our world has got less and less and less. I don't mean we fight with each other. I mean, I want to go to a place where I can go and break some pots. I want to go, you know, I'd, li I'd, like, a, I'd like a building site where I can go and smash up idea. stuff like that, you know, because I want to... The anger is an energy which builds up inside you. Because let's not forget, there's a, there's, there's a huge, hideous anger in kind of keeping quiet. Yeah, right, dear, whatever you want, you know. That is huge anger, which can't actually be tackled. The other person can't even accuse you of being angry. I've got a, a, a Facebook comment here from uh, a listener called Miller, Miller James Popovich. She wrote on our Facebook wall, Men love to make women happy, but these days we just don't let them. Abby, would you care to unpick that? Do you know what she's up to there? Um, we, we don't let... Okay, I think there is something that's happened recently where there's certain pressures that are put on men that aren't put on women. Kind of psychological thing that if you lose your job, for example, you're failing at your role in life. Mm. I imagine it might be stronger for all, men. All three men in the studio are nodding along. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely true if you talk to any of the male suicide charities, you know, Calm, Papyrus, all of them, Samaritans. Now, they all say that joblessness really impacts upon men a lot more yeah. than does women because we are societalised to be providers oh, and the warriors and all of that kind of old fashion bullshit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm, I want to challenge this word societized, culturalized, whatever like that. I think, true, we are. The culture tells us to be providers. The culture tells us not to be vulnerable. The culture tells us not to talk about our emotions as men. But we can change that. Well, the culture is not fixed. We can go out and say, you know what? Yeah, the culture tells us that, but I'm going to behave differently. And then when I start behaving differently, maybe my mates will start behaving differently. But and is the it people culture? around us will. Mm. Is it culture or is it instinct? Because when you're talking about joblessness It's culture. There, it's culture. No, you go to Thailand and you find people who are very, very happy with male and female roles, which are very different from us. Right, example. but what I was getting at is uh, instinctually, man as provider, hunter-gatherer, all of that stuff. Working <laughs> in an open-plan office or whatever is very different to going out and chasing mm -hmm. down wildebeest. 
Yeah. Martin, how did you feel when Loaded closed down? Um, relieved. You know, I left Loaded magazine when I became a father and I became a stay-at-home dad. How's that for change? I, I, what can I... Just something you said about men feeling like no one cares about their problems. Something who said? Martin's. Like so much of what you write it frames it as, you know, because of feminism, they're at odds with each other. And it's like, do, do you think the reason some of the young men on the internet who are very angry... It is because they, yeah, they feel because we're allowed to express our emotions in the way they feel they're not allowed to. And they sort of, because it, it would seem weird to me to blame feminism for that. Mm. Um, we focus a lot, don't we, on angry young men um, through the manosphere, through Twitter. Um, I think it's a bit of a red herring. I, I just think all of us are able to vent our negative emotions easier and with the safety of anonymity, both men and women. And I think, um, I hope it's it's a momentary experiment where we're going to get it off our chests and then we'll move on and be decent. That's what I hope. I get, I get threatened. People tell me they're going to find where I live and they're going to hurt me. Now and that must make you angry. But just... I, I, See, I don't mind how you deal with that. Because as, Darren. As, a, as a police officer... We should be able to take it. So you kind of, you, you go through training and it's, you're going to be called a fat ginger, <laughs> you know, and the way you deal with it, it's kind of like... Well, sometimes I get, sometimes sometimes I lose my temper. I'm not going to I never lose my temper. And does it but, feel good sometimes? Um, well, no, because I always feel like then they've won it, haven't they, if they've made you angry. But I think it's different as mm. a policeman actually having to physically be there must you know, be different. You know, I've been clear on this, or I've written on this, and I think any man who delivers a rape threat, either in person or online, is a traitor to masculinity. You know, they are, they are letting the side down, and I think, you know, people who say these things are, are, are maggots. Well, I'm sure this discussion has made a lot of you very angry. Uh, others, though, will just be angry that we have run out of time. Uh, my thanks to Martin Daubney, Abin Wilkins... My, thank <laughs> my thanks to Martin Daubney, Abby Wilkinson, Darren Finch, mm, Joe Queen, and, and David Baker. Uh, next week, heroism. Email your thoughts to the mailroom at bbc.co.uk. Heroic responses only, please. See you then. <laughs>